Welcome to Caravan, the art of wayfaring podcast that tells the stories of people and places in Turkey. I remember watching movies and documentaries about the important chapters of world history while I was growing up. It didn't matter if I was learning about ancient Troy or the Roman Empire, the armies of Genghis Khan or or even the world wars. All of it felt vaguely like a fantasy novel. It was like I would think, surely the Middle East isn't much farther from Western Canada than Middle Earth might be. All that changed in December 2014. I had grown up and I moved to Turkey with my wife. I very quickly began to get the sense that we were close to everything. First, it was the events on the news. Syria and Iraq and Greece dominated international headlines that year, and each of them border Turkey. Then I started to look at flights to cities that I was interested in visiting in Europe and in Asia, and that feeling just continued to grow. It was only two hours to Cairo, four hours to London. It almost seemed like I could walk to Beijing if I really wanted to. And as that feeling of near proximity settled in, the next thing that quickly became apparent was that not only had we moved closer to the places featured in history, it was like we had closed the gap to that history itself. It was as if the link with the ancient past that you would normally get through textbooks or lessons in films had been eliminated. It wasn't just those things. It was like all of a sudden I was talking to the people who had lived the events themselves, them and their children, of course. There were people in my neighborhood who were there when the Berlin Wall fell or who had vacationed in a free and liberal Iran or who had been born as citizens of the Ottoman Empire. Some of my neighbor's parents and grandparents had participated in the Bolshevik Revolution or got caught up in the formation of the State of Israel. Suddenly and unexpectedly, I found myself living with only one or two degrees of separation between me and the fabric of global history itself. Now, I should say that most of this happened almost completely unnoticed. It was more of a sense at first than a conscious insight, but it was clear enough that I found myself remarking on it to my Turkish teacher one day during class on the edge of the Bosphorus. And that's when she began to tell me about a truly unforgettable story. At one time, the Ottoman Empire was a global juggernaut, conquering new lands and routing armies. But those days had come to an end. As all empires do, this one started to get sloppy and decadent in the glow of its wealth. So by the end of the 19th century, The Ottomans were no longer winning major conflicts and no longer striking fear into the heart of vassal states. In fact, pieces of the empire were breaking off. The old ways couldn't stand up to the tide of nationalism that would also crush other empires in Europe. In the late 1800s, the Balkans had become the stage for one of these major conflicts. As different ethnic and religious groups began to vie for power, it became clear that the Ottoman Empire didn't have the strength to hold on to the region. Although non-Turkish and non-Muslim minorities were excited for the opportunity to throw off the Ottomans, there were also many Muslims living in towns throughout the Balkans. Families and neighbors that had lived together for generations were becoming enemies because of these divided loyalties. And wherever there was division, the losing side was bound to suffer. Depending on where you lived, you might escape atrocity altogether. Sadly, however, when a militant Muslim group took territory, it often spelt tragedy for non-Muslim locals. Likewise, when non-Muslim militant forces would come in and take a town, it meant violence and often death for Muslim civilians. So it was in what we today call Bulgaria. Bulgarian Muslims began to look to Anatolia, which is today modern-day Turkey, as a safe haven for Muslim refugees. Between 1878 and 1912, at least 350,000 people made the journey from Bulgaria to Anatolia. They came in waves, often traveling on foot or with pack animals and small carts. They lost most of the few possessions that they had along the way, and some even died making the journey. It's difficult, I think, for modern minds to grasp such a journey. Imagine that no one in your family had traveled more than 50 kilometers away from home, at least not in living memory. You don't have any up-to-date information about what militant group is in control of what region, even if you're about to pass through it. People who have been your friends before 
now belong to a new country, a country that actually only existed in the vision and in the hearts and in the ambitions of their particular ethnicity, which sadly is an ethnicity that you don't share with them. You couldn't walk openly on the roads for fear of harassment from armed forces from both sides. Thieves were also common. Gangs were made up of desperate people taking advantage of vulnerable people. There were no hospitals where you could seek help. There were empty food markets. And you have children with you and elderly relatives. What do you do when somebody gets sick? You would have to weigh the price of stopping to rest versus pushing on and potentially spending the last of the infirm relative's dying strength. Worse, what do you do after a loved one has died, when the deceased and when you yourself have no money, no rights, and no land? A sizable part of Turkey's current population is made up of the descendants of people who lived through this very ordeal. Some of the harrowing stories and cunning survival wisdom has been passed down from generation to generation. For instance, how does a father with young children lead his family through the night toward a land that he's never been? How do you keep from blundering into enemy soldiers or injuring yourself on geographic features? As the sun set, families would gather on the edge of town and look south or east and listen for the echoes of the distant call to prayer. When they would catch it, they would point their shoes in the direction that they had heard it come from and lay down for a rest. Then, at midnight, when everything was dark, they would put those shoes back on and they would march in the direction that they had been facing until the darkness started to lift with the early dawn. As long as you could hear a mosque, it meant that that town wasn't occupied by non-Muslim forces, they reasoned. And so you would travel mile after mile, night after night, until you reached the road to Istanbul. And can you imagine the shock of crawling out of a war zone and into the imperial city? Istanbul was full of ancient buildings crowded in on narrow cobbled streets with wooden houses. Locals would call the newcomers from Bulgaria, Muhajir, an Ottoman word meaning immigrant. I'm sure there are as many amazing stories as there are Muhajir to tell them. It was one of these stories that my Turkish teacher was relating to me. She began by telling me about Levhie. Levhie was a young girl in a family of four. At the time these events took place, she was old enough to remember the escape to Istanbul, but she wasn't old enough to know her exact age. She could remember her little baby brother, too. So much the harder, she said, to run with. The militants who had come to their town came quickly, and they came in winter. There was little warning, but thank God there was some. Her father and her mother quickly bundled some clothes together and some blankets, some food and some valuables, and they dressed their children. The weather was cold, and the time was short, so the mother swaddled the baby with a few extra layers. They started out from home, but the hard leather boots of the pursuing soldiers just came after them. A few other families were running toward the train tracks. Of course, her father thought. The train was just leaving the station, but if they ran, they would be able to jump on while it was still gathering speed. Levier's father grabbed her hand and yelled to the family to run. He nearly pulled her arm out of her socket, she remembers. They were running through the deep snow now, getting closer to the train, but the soldiers were right behind them, hot on their heels. If they caught them, would they rob them? Would they kill them? Would something worse than those things happen? And if they were caught, would they ever escape and be able to find safety and freedom? Levier looked back and noticed her mother falling behind. Her father had taken the heavier load and Levier herself, but her mother was struggling with the bundle of clothes and with the little baby boy. Throw the clothes away, her father yelled. We have to catch this train. Her mother tossed the bundle to the ground, and despite the fact that it meant that they would only have the clothes on their backs to start the new life, she reasoned at least they would have a new life. A few soldiers stopped at the bundle but the rest kept running right up until the moment that Levier and her family jumped on the moving train. Friendly hands pulled them into the open cattle car and they sat down gasping to catch their breath. It was then her mother thought to give the baby some air and to feed it. She opened the bundle and found nothing but clothes. 
In the frenzied rush to get away from the soldiers, the distraught mother had accidentally confused the bundle of clothes she was carrying with her baby, and rather than leaving the clothing behind, she had dropped him. By the time this awful truth was discovered, it was too late for the family to go back. That was an unforgettable moment for Levier. That time on the old train as it creaked and rocked its way towards safety, and as her father comforted her mother, and as a family, they began to come to grips with shrinking by one. She never found out what happened to her sibling. Maybe he died at the hands of the soldiers, or the cold, but maybe he was given to another Muhajir family on the way, or maybe he was even raised as one of the locals' own. Levhie and her family did make it to Istanbul. We have to imagine that adjusting was difficult, especially after how much the trip had cost them. But life went on for them. Levhie grew up. She learned the accent of Turkish spoken in Istanbul. She went to school. She got married. Her parents had another son too. Together, they all witnessed World War I and the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the creation of the Turkish Republic. Levhie never moved away from the city that took her in. My Turkish teacher shocked me when she asked if I would like to meet her. It turned out that she knew this story and Levye herself because they were relatives. My teacher's great-grandmother was actually Levye's aunt. Of course I would like to meet her, I said. Just give me a couple weeks, I'm really busy right now. Putting off that meeting with Levye was a choice that I wouldn't be able to unmake. She wasn't feeling well when I brought up the idea of meeting her again a few weeks later, and she fell seriously ill sometime later. After a hundred years of vibrant life, she quickly faded into illness and passed away shortly thereafter. I got the news that she had slipped away at a later lesson. On my way home from class after I found the whole thing out, I stood on the bus as it crawled through traffic and I thought about this woman's story and about all the stories that I had begun to come across living in Istanbul. Refugees, doctors, freedom fighters. These tales were inspiring and terrible and magnetic. That was where this podcast, Caravan, was born. Levhi's story is the one that started it all, and so this very first episode is dedicated to her, her lost sibling, and to Dilek, her relative and my Turkish teacher. I want you, the listener, to understand the beginning so that as these stories unfold, you might also get a hint to the amazing breadth of the human history that's etched into the landscape of Turkey. There will be three kinds of stories that you will hear on Caravan. The first is like the one you just heard, the lives of ordinary people that we encounter and the extraordinary circumstances that they face in their own life. The second is like it, but a little less personal. We'll do some research and tell the stories of people who made their mark on the history of Anatolia through the ages. Finally, we decided also to tell the story of some of the significant places in the country, these stages where the human epics that we tell shifted the balance of world history. We'll do our best to help you enter into the story of the people we're telling, including their culture and their language and their worldview and the setting that we first heard the story in wherever possible. Some of these people you'll even be able to visit if you come to Turkey on vacation. 